Thank you. And I'm actually very happy that I'm coming at the end because I had uh, the benefit of uh, some feedback from this morning, but I think this panel has uh, provided a lot of food for thought and will allow me to focus on just a couple of things that I believe can be of interest for all of you. Um, you all remember Copenhagen Climate Change Conference. I think it was very much a landmark in terms of uh, failure. Everybody uh, considered that the expectations were quite high and then the outcome was very, very, very small. But when we think about the process behind Climate Change Conference in Copenhagen, a lot of things happened there that are interesting for us just to pause for a minute and try to understand. The first one is that we had the equivalent of uh, a green room of the WTO, for those who are familiar with trade negotiations, which is a group of special people that decide on behalf of the rest, despite the fact that uh, the rest are supposed to also be part of the decision and eventually everything has to be approved by consensus in order to allow the processing to take place. There is a special group of people that are sort of the, the catalysts of, of, the, of, of, of the rest. And you have in Copenhagen something similar happening where a couple of presidents, uh, for those who have the image still present in their minds, uh, met and finally rescued the conference with a statement that was fabricated by this small group. Uh, and what was fascinating is that this group didn't include the European Union, it didn't include uh, Denmark, and the conference was taking place in Denmark, in Copenhagen. And it was really a very good demonstration of how the world has changed so much. And in fact, you know, in the, in the aftermath of 2008-2009 crisis, it was very important also for us to reflect why a G20 was necessary. Again, the G20 is like a small green room uh, in terms of number of countries of the world, and then they decide because they are the ones best represented in terms of economic strength. So you have a repetition of this formula in different ways, and you try to understand why, despite having this formula that apparently has been tested so many times and seems to, to be the preferred one, things don't go right and we continue to have problems. And the explanation is that today, uh, no matter how many people you put in a room uh, with budgets, the real negotiators are not necessarily the ones that have the budgets and, and, and enter the room. The real negotiators are the ones that are capable of processing the information, uh, synthesize the information, and get influence with their view about the different subjects being discussed. So you may have 6,000 people that were accredited to go into the main hall of Copenhagen, but everybody knows that about 80,000 actually went to Copenhagen. That's the official numbers of the organizers and had all kinds of accreditations of different sorts, but were not allowed in the negotiating room in Copenhagen. Why 6,000 places transformed themselves into 80,000 people wanting to lobby? And in fact, we know it's not just 80,000. These 80,000 were representatives of a much larger group that didn't go to Copenhagen. And the answer is cell phone. You know, you can with a cell phone know what is going on in the room. So everybody that is not in the room can actually get the news about what is going on in the room. And everybody that is interested, one way or another, has to plug itself to one of the very cells that are actually negotiating. And that is why we have Doha Round being discussed for 15 years. Uh, that is why we have the disarmament uh, negotiations going on for two decades. And that is why climate change conference, we are now entering into 10 years of negotiation. And we can go on every single important subject, not to mention the ones related to the financial sector, as a hard time being negotiated these days. And I think uh, this reality, the reality of our days, where there is a lot of information, needs a special category of people that are capable of influencing and processing and synthesizing 
And those are the think tanks. And how the think tanks use this capacity is going to be whether they make a difference or not. Those who do it very well are extremely influential, and those who pretend or don't know how to do it, they don't have much influence. So the issue is what kind of a role are we expecting think tanks from Africa to play in this very complex world? And this is just one uh, aspect of it, because I'm just talking about the global dimension. There is also the national dimension, there are other dimensions. But on the global one, it's very interesting because somehow we have a replica of this type of very difficult correlations at the national level. And for those who think that IT is not really as present in Africa as it is in other parts of the world, well, the news is just going to the ITU statistics and you see the level of penetration is increasing uh, at, at, at a rate that, you know, we cannot not even cope with. Right now, more cell phones in Africa than in the rest of uh, the various uh, regions, including uh, India, including the US, and including Europe. The only one that beats us right now is China. Uh, so I think uh, we really have to prepare ourselves for a very different world where the, the quality of the information is no longer measured by a, a group of people that are capable of uh, taking care of it, but rather a huge number of interlocutors are involved in any given process, and we need people that are capable of this uh, role of synthesizing processing and, and, and therefore uh, capable of doing interpretation. And when you do that, and the role of think tanks is partly to provoke discussion, you need a maturation process, you need processing. Now this processing is something that really we have to look into how it is done right now and we will come very quickly to the conclusion that it is done uh, with the same characteristics that uh, Gosana was, was saying about you know, inheriting models that are not necessarily uh, owned by us and uh, by virtue of just adhering to them without a self-critical uh, look into how they function uh, may drag us into becoming tokens and tokenism. Uh, you are part of many networks. Uh, there is not a single important network on an important subject that would look for some Africans to be present there. But that doesn't mean they want the opinion from the Africans. They want the Africans to be part of the network because that is important to legitimize whatever is going to be done by the said network. And it's up for the Africans to play this role of tokenism or actually turn it upside down and do it in a completely different way. And if we are going to do it in a completely different way, we enter to my second point, which is we need to strategize. And that's very much a role of the think tanks. It's to be capable of strategizing. Now, if we are going to strategize, we have to <laughs> decolonize the minds to be able to strategize in the interest that is not important. And if you are going to strategize, it's about actually also mastering a certain number of tools. And these tools are what we can call planning, some will call management, it doesn't matter, some will call governance. But you have to master a certain number of tools to be able to strategize. Here at ECA we say the most important of all is statistics and making sure that we have quality in terms of the numbers because without that, we are not going to be able to claim the narrative. You cannot claim the narrative if you don't control the numbers. So we've invested a great deal in trying to introduce data accountability. Data accountability is about not letting people run numbers about Africa that are not related to some sort of accountability. I will give you some examples. People would say, well, Africa is not integrating because we have 11% trade intra-Africa trade. Is it really? Is it really 11% intra-Africa trade? Everybody knows that the quality of our statistics on trade are very precarious, that most of our trade in the borders is done informally, that some of our more complex integration efforts like uh, on roaming or financial services are not captured by the current regulator's capacity. And we can go on with examples such as to say, is it only about trade 
or integration has other dimensions. It's a multi-dimensional phenomenon. So we are coming up, we are coming up together with the African Union and the African Development Bank with a regional integration index that has 78 categories that will allow for people really to have a real picture of integration. Uh, another example, uh, people go and project uh, GDP growth or uh, uh, inflation or whatever macro indicator they like and they get away with it because nobody's tracking whether this forecast has any relation with reality. So starting this month we are publishing country profiles for each country and one of the characteristics of the country profiles is that we track the forecasters, what they said and what happened. And then we give them a notation for accuracy. And we do the same with statistical series. We put the statistical series, we check whether they have followed the international agreed standards for methodological uh, completeness or accuracy, and then we give them a column that reflects whether they are a red statistic, meaning methodologically really failing, or a yellow statistic, meaning it's satisfactory but needs improvement, or a green statistic really on the mark. These type of uh, tools that we can call whatever we want are essential for us to do good stra strategic uh, uh, advice and, and, and therefore think tanks are not really going to make the difference just by proclaiming very easily it's evidence based, I'm doing uh, research and, and, and policy advice based on evidence when the evidence is captured through data that there's no quality. So we have to start right from the beginning. And then finally, my last point is about this issue of independence that has been mentioned by many of the speakers in the panel, uh, uh, starting with uh, Dr. Niwai. I think, uh, really, if we, if we distill the various interpretations of uh, independence, uh, we are going to come close to a debate about what is a real think tank, what is not a think tank, all kinds of uh, very abstract interpretations of what it should be, should not be, I think it's not really very useful. Uh, because we can find for every example that looks nice, some uh, misgivings and vice versa. For those who look uh, not necessarily attractive, also very influential. So I think influence is really what uh, really matters. Whether this thinking and, uh, is strategic and influential. And for me, there are three ways of measuring influence for think tanks. The first is whether there is trust and credibility in what the think tank is proposing. And I think uh, if, if you have that, you have already quite a plus. Second, is to make sure that it is insightful and it is original. And original not in the academic sense, that you know, each time you produce a PhD thesis, it has to be original, completely different from what others did. Original in the sense that it is targeted, focused, and is capable of really making a difference. That type of originality. And finally, that it is effective. Now, effective for me, for a think tank, is that it is implementable. It's not pipe dream. It's not completely out of focus with the reality. It is grounded. And I think if you have these three, then you are influential. And if you are influential, that's what matters. You are a real think tank. No matter what kind of statutes you may have. Uh, now, if I take this filter and I'll go into Agenda 2063 very quickly. You know, Agenda 2063 is an attempt for us to refocus from uh, some shortcomings of the past. That's what it is. I have been involved intrinsically into the process to know that is the real motivator. And the real motivator can be translated in the word ownership, but it's also the long-term vision, not uh, all the way to astrology. <laughs> uh, but, you know, to give people an aspiration that corresponds to ambition. And you cannot aspire with a sufficient level of ambition if it is shorter. Because we are constrained by what Africa has been 
capable of producing all the dependency that we have been experiencing and we want to liberate we want to liberate people to think big and that you, that goes with some some degree of aspiration that has to be long term and 50 years is a very interesting way of taking it because it was launched during the 50 years of uh, of, of the anniversary or jubilee anniversary of the OAU AU so it's the next 50 years what we don't want to be repeated because it was not good, and what we want to be repeated because it was good. And in this uh, process, I think if you are looking into the role of think tanks, uh, it's really to define in a much more shrewd way what is the transformative proposal that is behind Agenda 2063. And this word has not been used enough by the panel. It's about transformation, and the transformation goes all the way from an economic side, we can say it's about making sure that the composition of GDP is going to change, that industrialization is going to come, agricultural productivity, all these things that we have been discussing uh, left, right, and center. But it's also transformation in many other aspects, socially, for instance. Uh, the social policies, someone mentioned the demographic dividend, Demographic dividend is, is a take that is very much an external take on what can be done or not done. I'm not necessarily against it, but I'm saying it has to find its way in why Africa wants to be a transformative continent or a, tra a transformation continent. It has to be because of that level of aspirations being so big. And it has to do, it has a lot to do with megatrends megatrends in favor of the continent. And one of those is precisely the demographic. That is a much better way of starting the discussion than starting from the, the end of, uh, of a demographic dividend. The megatrends are in our favor because, you know, the rest of the population is aging. And no matter what we've been told, that we have to do the right policies for youth and this and that, all of that is true. But most importantly, is that by 2050, Japan is going to have 100,000 people over 100 years. And they have 200% GDP debt ratio. How are they going to do it with the old people? They need us. And I can repeat the story so many times. It's the mega trends that make the big difference. And this is the kind of transformative policies that have to be behind Agenda 2063. And then we come with the tools, we come with the the domestication at the national level, at the uh, at local level, you have all these different entry points. But provided we understand that this is about a huge transformative agenda. And I don't think this has been present enough in the debate by the, the different think tanks in Africa. First of all, they concentrate a lot on the international global links with Africa. Let's say climate change is a good example. I, and I like that one because climate change for us should be completely different from what has been discussed so far. Climate change in Africa is a huge opportunity because we have to make the case that our natural resources to be transformed locally, at least part of it, because we'll never go into uh, dominate the full global value chains. It, it, it will be a stupidity to think so. But just if you transform about 15%, can you imagine the reduction of CO2 emissions? Because we are exporting everything raw uh, to the other end of the world, and then you know they export again, transform to the other end of the world, when this can be transformed in Africa and reduce CO2 emissions. We can empower the entire industrialization of the continent with renewable energy, because we have the vast and probably the, the most spectacular potential, that we can leapfrog the technologies, that we can make sure that Africa is actually going to concentrate much more on its internal market. And that is also a, a very strong uh, contribution for uh, less CO2 emissions. Well, all of this is not discussed. We discussed, you know, climate adaptation. We, we you know, what, how much we are going to get on capacity development funds. This is a very reduced agenda, and this is somehow what most of African think tanks dealing with climate change are, are, are discussing. 
And this is just one example. I can take others on trade. It's the same. So this link to the global, before we define what is the trans transformative agenda, is hampering the quality of the influence. And influence, I repeat again, is about trust, credibility, yes, but also insight, originality, and also about effectiveness, which comes with, is it implementable? Yes, it is. A lot of the things that we are saying require much more study, require much more engagement, and I think this is a great opportunity for us to engage in such a debate. Thank you.